When the Lord comes back. When the Lord comes back, every eye shall see, every one shall gasp, and every one will bow the knee. The Lord will divide the crowds. The crowds will go left and go right. The ones on the right will be proud, for they will live with the Savior and have eternal life. The ones on the left will be cast out. Their names will not, were not found in the book of life. To the lake of fire they will be cast about, those who love the darkness and not the light. But the ones on his right shall reign evermore. With praise, they will praise the Lord day and day. Hallelujah, flesh will be gone, no need to snore, for we'll never tire. And give praise and walk with him upon the shore. If you knew that your sermons were going to be set to poetry, I think you would choose your words very carefully. <laughs> You know, I find it interesting that he didn't use the first portion of Brother Gresham's message and have poetry about epistemological <laughs> views and the veracity of God. Maybe, maybe when he hits high school, when he hits high school, he can use those words. Our first text, Revelation chapter 1, the first three verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now, I, for one, am glad that in verse 3, the blessing is not pronounced on those that understand every part of the book. Blessing's not pronounced on them. Though if you do, you'll be blessed. The blessing's on those that read the book. The blessing is on those that hear the, the words of it. So that's us right here even during this meeting. And those that keep the things that are written therein. Now, you go through this book and you find everything that you're supposed to do a good believer will respond keep your garments you can you understand that is that true for all the history of the church was it true for the the brethren that received this toward the end of the first century yes was it true during the uh, middle ages yes was it true during the reformation yes is it true in our day if the lord waits another thousand years is it going to be true a thousand years from now yes it's always be true whatever time the church is, it'll always be true that the blessing is on those that read, that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep the things written therein. Amen. And if you don't understand uh, accurately some of the nuances and details, that's all right. Those things will be shown to you when the time has come. But I will say this, this book has been something that the saints have wrestled with ever since it was written. In fact, not only this book, but all the letters of the apostles as well. So our goal during this time, and, and I don't know, some of you may have heard me refer to my lecture on Thursday. That's called foreshadowing. I'm letting you know that I'm going to begin with a larger section. The reason is I want to lay a foundation and I want to set some, some boundaries for this time. One of the things I want us to see is that the message of the details of the return of Christ don't have a monolithic view that, oh, the first century, everybody understood it then and somehow it got hidden. What did Paul have to do to the church of Thessalonica? Uh, wasn't that an, an apostolic founding? Wasn't that right there? What did they have? They had brethren that misunderstood it. They thought he was going to come right away, so they quit their jobs. And he said, no, 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 this, there's going to be this other things. And so he writes to them, talks about man of sin, talks about the lawless one, all, all this stuff in there. That's right in his generation. In the days of the apostles, there had to be a clarifying on some of those details. Now, it blesses me to know that Peter, in his epistles, at the very end, he writes about Paul's 
scripture, at Paul's writing, it, things that are hard to understand sometimes. I think that's fair. There's no shame in that. If you come to some of these things, say, I, I don't see how it all works together. That's okay. There's levels of maturity and time and so on. But what I want us to have through this time is, is a level of humility to acknowledge that we don't have all the details because we don't need all the details. What we need is the hope. Why do you think the messages that you've heard over the last day and that you'll hear tonight are the ones you did? Did you notice that we didn't say, okay, we're going um, to have 12 messages. So you take Revelation 20, verse 1. You take verse 2. You take verse 3. And you just make everything about Revelation 20. Now, there are some prophecy conferences that would do just that. They would do just that. Never dip into Matthew. Never quote, actually, the words of our Lord himself. Never get in the red letter. It'd just be all about this one passage that, frankly, has been a misunderstood passage from the beginning now. Did you, the people that John was writing to, yes, I think they understood it. But I'm telling you, from the first, cent, first generation after them, not even a full century has passed, there's already, what exactly did the Lord mean when he said that through John? What exactly did the Spirit mean writing in Paul when he said? So we, we need to have some, some uh, humility in that, since we are coming 20 centuries later. Now what things are really important to understand? Eschatology is a big word. That's our first vocabulary word tonight. I know some of you kids are keeping notes by direction of the parents, which is an excellent idea. Eschatology is the study of last things. So the coming of the Lord, uh, the resurrection of the dead, the end of the devil, all those things come under that. That's a very important subject. Any, any school that teaches a classical theology uh, program will have that as part of it. They don't get rid of it. It's, it's in there. But you know what else is also important? Christology, the study of Christ, Amen. the nature of Christ. Who is the Christ? What is he like? Brethren, if I have to choose one of those areas to be mistaken in, I'll be mistaken in my eschatology. Amen. Because if I'm mistaken in my Christology, I'm a heretic. Now, don't miss this. You go back. Do you know how long the early church wrestled over the issue of the, the nature of the Christ? Three centuries. Back and forth. That's how big a subject this is. You go and look it up. Try and look for big, long volumes on the coming of the Lord. Look for a late, great planet Earth in the first three centuries. You don't find it. They had, they had bigger game to pursue. They had to decide... Not how is he coming back, but they had to decide who is coming back and who is in and, frankly, who is out. And so you have in Christ one who is called the Son of God, one who is called the Son of Man. And so the early brothers trying to formulate on this, somebody, they go and push it too far the other way. And he becomes some phantom that adopts a man's body and just kind of takes over that Jesus of Nazareth for a while. And then when the crucifixion comes, that Christ spirit goes back into the eons and the, the man Jesus dies. And there's no resurrection. That's heresy. That's outside of the Christian community. Amen. We don't have to apologize for it. That's outside. We can be broad and ecumenical and generous, but boy, on that, that's when you say that's outside. Other people go the other way. They'll, they'll, they'll make him just uh, some kind of spirit being that only looked like a man. You go all over the board. And so those early brothers, they'd meet and they'd talk about this. That's why you have the books you have from those times. There's a man named Athanasius that God raised up for that moment. I praise the Lord that he was there. This is a crucial time. And he wrote a work, boy, to read it. It's 40 or 50 pages on, long called On the Incarnation long. I'm glad he was there because I wasn't thinking like he was, but he was precisely the man that they needed to hold back the Arianism that was going to sweep in. This false heretical doctrine that was going to come in. He's holding them back on showing the nature of the incarnation. So if you have to pick what's fundamental, who's Christ? Eschatology is important, but we want to be very careful that we do not make it the, the, the mark that determines who's in and who's out, who receives our right hand, who doesn't. Amen. 
Let's, let's bear in mind there are some things, and those are the things we've talked about this week, and, and this is how I put it in letters when I'd write to area churches, letting them know about it. We're not talking about the things we think people ought to know. This week is dedicated to the things that we can know and, yea, must know about the return of Christ. Those are the nature of the messages. Brother Seth. Uh, you've just reached a point where you should understand there are two ways of knowing. Those who have the wrong view of Christ were beginning with the idea that matter is all evil and spirit is all good, yep. and they drew their conclusions from those assumptions. Those who believe that Jesus was real in the body and real in the spirit and was uh, sacrificed to God for getting their knowledge by exegesis of the scripture, what God said. Yes. Now you can either read carefully what God says and get his word, or you can start with a philosophy and right. set it aside because it's impossible to fit your philosophy. Yeah. And that's the thing here we're, we're talking about, uh, not only what's essential to know, but how you know it, that's what makes it. When I'm, when I'm driving, now our trip from, from Illinois is a very mild trip. Four-lane highway most of the way, and then you drive through some wooded areas. It's very 45 miles an hour. If I go off on any stretch of that, I might lose the car. I might total the car. I won't be hurt seriously. I'm not going all that fast, and the road's pretty level. Now, when I was down in Mexico about four summers ago, and you're up in, at 5,000 feet, 9,000 feet, 11,000 feet, and these aren't made by U.S. crews, these roads that wind and back and forth, you don't go clipping right along those kind of roads. Because if you make a mistake on those kind of roads, you're lost. Yeah. And I don't mean you don't know where you're going. I mean you're, you're dead. Well, in these areas... When we talk about the nature of Jesus, who is he? What is he like? That's a mountainous area. You be real careful where you're driving in those areas. You don't get, become hasty. You don't say things off the cuff because you, you know what? You'll fall into heresy because you get sloppy in your expression. So just be very careful on that when you're speaking about those things. What the, uh, the brothers came and affirmed was what scripture affirms? Son of God, son of man. Not competing, not contradicting, but yes, both. Jesus is both. And when we talk about eschatology and the, the matters of this week, the end time, it's a little different area. Because there's some things that are clear and there's other things that frankly aren't emphasized near as much as who the Christ is. You go through the epistles and over and over it's telling you about Jesus. Over and over. You can't miss it. If somebody comes to Scripture and comes out with the idea that Jesus was just a man that the Spirit adopted, they're wrong. They've missed it. But please bear in mind, if some brothers come to Scripture and they come out with views that differ with us on some of the details, this is not always out of a wicked, malicious motive. Sometimes it's just a mistake. We have to bear in mind there's different levels of maturity, different environment, different forces shaping us. So we want to have some generosity. Again, doesn't mean we, we don't care about Scripture. But it does mean we care about the unity of the body as well. And we care about being brothers and sisters in Christ. Because you know, if you talk to a Hindu, they're not going to care what your millennial view is. Why? That's not, that's not part of their discussion at all. The discussion about the millennium and about what's going to happen in the year 2000 and all that stuff, do you realize that's a Christian debate? It's within the body. Now there may be some I know that are wolves in sheep clothing. I'm aware of that. But I'll say at least in, in a surface sense, they make a profession of Christ. I'm not going to judge their destiny, but we're the ones that debate about it. Time magazine, they see it as a curiosity. U.S. News and World Report in the past year had a cover article on prophecy, and they, they look at it, and it's a curiosity, but it's not really their doctrine. It's ours. It's our area we look into uniquely. The Buddhists don't care about it. The atheists don't care about it. They're outside the Christian community. When I was at uh, Indiana University Northwest, when I started college just up the street, Gideons were there placing New Testaments. And uh, so I, I was a young believer. I walked over and introduced myself, encouraged them, accepted the New Testament, thanked them for their work, get into uh, chemistry. And what, what are my carnal classmates? Where do they go in the book? 
Where do they go in the Bible? When you get a free New Testament, what do they turn to? Revelation. Nobody asked me about Romans. They wanted to know about Revelation. Nobody asked me about Hebrews. They wanted to know about the harlot. That's where they're digging around, looking at these pictures and images that are described there, the visions. There's a carnal fascination with the book. Now, that's bled into the church. And there's some doctrines that foster it. They really do. There's some views of the book that foster this, this weird fear about the book. I heard about a man that went insane after reading the book. And you just have that view of the people <laughs> where God has said at the very beginning of the book where we started a blessing upon those that read this book, a blessing upon those that hear the words of the prophecy, a blessing on those that keep the things that are written therein. That's why you read it. You want to keep it. You want to obey it. You want to honor it. And, yeah, and you want to understand what God is doing. Has anybody here ever changed their mind doctrinally? I know you have. <laughs> I've, I've seen some of you do it. Big changes doctrinally. Major shifts in your whole orientation. How do you view the world, your role in Christ? You've had a radical shift. Some of you brothers have had a, a, a shift from, from almost a view from law to grace. You've had that big of a shift. Now you've had the change occur. Are you going to look at those that haven't made the change yet and say, you're out? Yeah. Be careful. Give the other people the same generosity that God has given you. He gave you time. Amen. He gave you time to stop being foolish and to get your head together and to think clearly. Be that generous with other brethren as well. Amen. Some people have spoken offhand and they just don't, they, they're unlearned. They don't know. But you know what? They may be in an, in an environment where they're the Einstein. Bear that in mind. They may be in an environment where nobody else is saying anything at all. So they have a good heart, they're going to try and do it, and they might be wrong in their understanding. But be generous with them as the Lord was generous with you. The things that we agree on in this matter are far larger and more significant than things that we could possibly disagree on. Far larger. Just the fact Jesus is coming again. You have just, uh, Brother Tim's testimony spoke on the God separating. You've just separated every, every atheist out. Psh, Jesus is coming again. You've separated those that have uh, the spirit of Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus and Alexander is also mentioned in the same context. Those that have say resurrection's already occurred and some other things and overthrew the faith of some. Which, you know, didn't that hurt happen in the days of the apostles? Didn't they have problems with this even in the very foundation? So if we go back to that foundation, don't be surprised if what you find is trouble with that too. You go to the word. That's the only constant all the way through. All the varieties of the history of the brethren. The word. The word. Whatever history might unfold from this point on. We, we have a rich tradition. That's fine. But you have the word all the way through. Amen. And that's why you can't put your trust in, in men. Jesus is coming again. We all agree on that. Everyone who is orthodox in their faith will believe that he is coming again in his own body. That his body isn't moldering in the grave and he gets some other celestial form and comes back in it. No, no, it's the body that rose out of that grave, the body he showed to Thomas and the others. That same Jesus and that same body is coming back. New and glorified in that sense, but not new as in something totally separate, some other one's body. He's coming with power. He's coming with glory. He's coming in judgment. We all agree on this. Everybody that names the name of Christ is going to agree on those things. Where we'll disagree is in matters of timing. Now, the reason that I wanted to cover some of these things is because, well, there's a few reasons. Let me just give you them. I would not want someone outside of this fellowship that we've expanded over these nine years to say, you talked about the coming of the Lord and never talked about Revelation or the millennium? Everybody else in the religious world's talking about it. I would not want them to say, you are afraid. I don't want to be thought of that way. I don't want to descend. I don't want to go to, uh, well, I have this view and I have that. I don't want to do that. But I want to acknowledge that the Lord has written this part of the scripture as well. Yeah. And he's written the old covenant as well. And, and, and have an ability to look at these things. Amen. Here's the other reason. 
You see all these young brethren in here? You think their friends don't have views on this? You think their friends aren't going to invite them to church night where you watch the three in the series, the thief in the night and the distant thunder and whatever else is out there? I, they've probably remade some of them with new technology. I don't know, but that's out there. I remember trying to be, being shaken as a child, not by the idea that Jesus is coming back, but by the idea that a rapture is coming and I could be left behind. I remember being frightened of a child, not of hellfire, but of a seven-year tribulation on earth. That's the danger of the view. Now again, I'm in a seminary that is premillennial. I'm right in the middle of it. When I had systematic theology that talked about this area, I had, now here's the, here it is, he's a progressive, dispensational, premillennialist. But I also regard him as a brother in the Lord. You know that brother? He believed. He was baptized. He saved. Any, any measure you want to put on it, he looks like brother to me. He's got the fruit of the Spirit in his life. Now, I disagree with him on this, but I can still give him my right hand. But your children are going to be hearing all kinds of stuff. And as our calendar unfolds in the next 18 months, 18 months, you're going to be hearing a whole lot about this, a whole lot about these things. So what I want to do is give... Uh, some of the basic definitions. I know you, you senior saints know these things, but these younger brethren, these are kind of new and they wonder about them. So we don't want them to find out about this stuff from their friends at school. We want them to find out about these things from us and have a clearer understanding. I'm just going to give some initial vocabulary and then we'll, we'll keep going. And I want to encourage you to marshal your physical resources here on the third day. What else happened on a third day? Well, that's right. Jesus came back from the dead. He rose from the grave. We can stay awake through an afternoon. Just pinch each other in the Lord. There's a term I've used is millennium. Here's a spelling tip. It always has two ends in it, which I found very helpful. It means a thousand years. It comes out of the Revelation 20 text. A thousand years. But the popular way of referring to it is millennium. Uh, some of you, if you read some of the old commentators, they'll talk about uh, Keolism or Kyleism, it's the it's same idea of a thousand, but it's a different uh, language they're referring to. What you'll have is a pre-millennialism, a post-millennialism, and an amillennialism. Those are the three basic views. I'm going to put this up here so everybody can see. You know your prefixes. Pre, post, and a. Uh, what's pre mean? Before. Before. Post. After. What's a uh, mean? Not. That's an unfortunate prefix, but there's not really a good substitute. So in this idea of premillennialism, the idea is that Jesus will come back, and then there will be an earthly reign of a thousand years on earth by the saints. In postmillennialism, the idea is there's a thousand year reign by the saints on earth, and then Jesus comes back. And in amillennialism, it doesn't teach that there's not a thousand-year reign. It teaches that there's not a thousand-year reign that is a literal thousand years. The millennium is seen as a symbol, as something that is pointing to some other truth. So they're taking the, millennial, uh, the millennium in an amillennial view as a symbol, as a figure. We will talk more about that. There, the interesting thing of these three views is there's different things they have in common. A, 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 a premillennialist, uh, certain camps of them will have a hope that Jesus could return at any moment. The $10 word for that is imminent. His return is imminent. He can come at any time. Most Amils I know are going to believe that too. He can come at any time. God doesn't have to check a calendar and check things off. My own understanding would be that when it does happen, we will have the insight to see what God has actually been doing. Because God is very careful in how he unfolds his history. Amen. But sometimes in the midst of it, you don't always recognize what's going on. Let's face it, not everybody at the temple at Jesus' presentation knew that was the Messiah. Amen. But Simeon did, and Anna was told as well. Others found out after. There are, again, I, just give me eight minutes, and then we'll be done with this and we'll move on. There are a wide variety of views here. They, they all follow the same pattern of a seven-year tribulation and a thousand-year reign. I'm going to symbolize that with a timeline 
that you have the seven years, you have the thousand year earthly reign, and then I'm gonna put ES here to stand for eternal state. That's how people will refer to it. Now here's the difference. Some will have Jesus coming back at the beginning of this time and the church leaving to meet him. And then they're with him and then they come back with him at the end of the seven and then they enjoy the thousand years. There's gonna be a whole host of variety of views on this, but you've heard them so I'm, I'm just summarizing. In, within their own camp, others are gonna say, no, it's midway through that the church is raptured. And then others say, no, it's at the end of the seven, they leave, they meet Jesus, and then they come right back for the thousand year reign. And so, though the seminary I go is unified in its premillennialism, all three views are represented on staff. In fact, they've written a book if you wanna know much more about this than you'd ever really want to know. Just read the book called The Rapture, Three Views. What they do is one affirms pre, and then the mid and the post-tribulational guy takes issue with them. And then the mid writes and they counter. It's healthy just to see the, the boundary of the debate. But that's a package. The post-millennial view, and again, there's some varieties there. Post-millennial, where you'll find them, and you will find them, it, it, you will find them. Currently, some Reformation churches, Reformed churches, uh, Reconstructionists, uh, last name of the one man, Rush Dooney, for those of you that know, that's where they come in. Who else, historically, will you find in a post-millennial camp? Campbell. What was the name of his order? The Millennial Harbinger. Think about the name, the Millennial Harbinger. The great mind, Campbell. Don't you dismiss post-millennialism too, too quickly. I'd be very careful on that. You know who else in our history as a nation? Jonathan Edwards, who to this day is regarded by those that know as the finest thing that North America has ever produced, period. That's up to now even, still the finest mind from the colonial days. Edwards was post-millennial. So be careful. And if you wanna play the game of who's, the, who's got the experts, well, Historically, you can put them all the way through here. My own leaning is, I think you can find some really big experts on the post and some really big ones on the amillennial. You can go back to Augustine, City of God, basically amillennial. You can find some heavy weights in church history on this side. So be very careful in this that you don't just, oh, you know, they're, they're not even to be considered. A premillennial view is basically, and some will differ with this, but you can't escape it, it's basically a pessimistic view the things really, really get bad. And then there's this golden age. And then there's an eternal state. But the golden age is by force. By force. Yes. By, by faith. Yes, it is. There will be a rebellion at the end of this time, according to their view, which is a very strange view in my mind, yeah, right. that Jesus can reign as king, but not completely. <clears throat> but we'll, I just want to touch on that. The post-millennial view, I've got to tell you, I find it rather encouraging just to read some of their writing. They've got a basic optimism about them. They've got a basic, you know, the gospel will change people. And if it changes people, those people are in a society. And if they're changed, then that society is going to be changed. And you find yourself reading it saying, I know politics isn't the answer and so on. But they're not giving up on the world either. They're not just saying, oh, well, why vote? Why be involved? Let's just run to the hills. You don't find that in there. They want to see culture change. I kind of appreciate the work that's out there by some of them. And by the way, when you read for 150 years ago, you read Campbell, read some of Charles Finney, sees widespread revival. He says at one point, I think the beginning of the millennium is about three years hence. Yeah. Other times later, he gets disappointed and he says, how many ages of millennial glory have been lost because the church won't pray? Mm. Now, I kind of appreciate that kind of faith that says, God expects us to be occupying till he comes. Not running and hiding in a cave somewhere, but being ready and working, salting the earth. This, there'll be some variety here, but what will happen is that uh, if you symbolize this as the, the time of Christ and his crucifixion and the time of his return, that there'll be varieties now, but basically during that time period, there is this thousand year reign of the church and again there's a whole host of varieties but what they do is they take the thousand year picture and make it uh, see it as a not literal but a figurative picture that's just the basics there I don't I don't want to debate those points there's there's books out there galore to look into it 
The point is, and all the way through this meeting, what has been from message one, what was Gene's message? The necessity of readiness. So that if all this, by the way, crumbles, and there's some alternatives that we don't even know about, and God decides, I'm going to do it this way, which he's decided from the foundation, by the way. I don't mean he's whimsical. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. As long as I'm ready. I want to be ready when he comes. So we want to, we want to guard that this doesn't become some, some club. Now, turn please to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. You all can keep breathing. Don't worry about it. The moment you say Daniel in some church meetings, you just feel the <sighs> breath kind of go out of people. Daniel 7. First seven verses. Daniel has this vision. He has a vision of four great beasts. First, like a lion, had eagle's wings. Verse 5, another beast like a bear. Verse 6, another's like a leopard, had four wings. Verse 7, fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, had great iron teeth. Now stop right there. Just that picture. This is what Daniel sees. Sees these visions. You can make an argument just right there that, well, okay, there'll come a day when there's an actual beast, flesh and blood, and the animal kingdom's going to look like this. There's going to be some lion, some winged lion. And you could maybe make some kind of crazy argument. Don't worry, nobody does, but follow me. Make the argument that, okay, someday God's going to make this winged lion, this winged lion will appear. You can make that argument so far. There's a, and that's called taking this text literally, at face value. But the problem is you'd have to stop right there to do that. Because if you keep reading, it talks about a horn, and there's a, a, the horn has eyes of a man and speaks like a man, and suddenly you're seeing the text. I, I don't think he's just talking about flora and fauna. I don't think he's just talking about natural animals here. And then... Look down in the chapter. He actually gets this text explained. This is one of those great passages where within Scripture, the preceding Scripture is explained. Look at verse 16. Uh, 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this, so he told me and made me know the interpretation of these things. Verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Well, right there, those pictures of the animals, he's not talking about a, an actual animal you touch. It's a picture of a kingdom. He tells you that. That's the difference between a literal and a figurative. Daniel is having this truth given to him in a figure. This is a picture of the details are behind it. So when you look at the history of this time, then you can see what's going on. You can see the rise of the kingdoms. You see this, this trait, Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire. You just see it. Just look at history. Say, oh, well, that's what it is. It's so clear that if you have a study Bible, what they'll do is they'll show you these beasts. Boom, boom, boom. And then they'll identify the kingdoms because they're identified in the text. Now, if you're going to have this understanding of Daniel and you come into a book like Revelation, why do you think it is there's people in this bottom part that will say, maybe this thousand years is a, is a picture of something else? Because in that same context of that book, he talks about a great red dragon. But I'm not afraid of some giant reptile coming. It's a picture. And that dragon is identified in Revelation. The, the, the deceiver, the old serpent, Satan, the devil, they tell you who it is. That's why people go the direction they do on some of these. You're in the Old Covenant Scriptures. Turn to Isaiah 65, please. Isaiah 65. the last half of the chapter. It's verse 17 and following. So, yes. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Former shall not be remembered nor come into mind, but be ye glad and rejoice forever. 
in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall no more, shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And then it goes on, and now listen to the language of this, verse 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old. It's an idea of longevity. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. It be thought lightly if you only lived a hundred years. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build another inhabit. They shall not plant another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And the passage goes on. Here's the most famous end, verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. The dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. This is not a lecture on animal physiology or biology. It's not the nature of Isaiah. Do you really think the people that Isaiah's message is coming to are going, oh, I'm so glad that the lion and the lamb will lay together. Actual, physical, put them in the same cage at the zoo. These people were going to go into captivity. These people were going to be abused. Their children were going to be taken off. The northern kingdom thrown away, southern kingdom, into captivity and comes back. That promise is to show them you're going to come, you're going to come back to this land. That's part of it. I know it's a big picture. I know there's an image here of, of Christ in the end and so on. But I've got to tell you, brethren, when the Jehovah Witness comes to my door and they give me the tract and says, we all want the same thing. We want peace on earth. I said, no, I want this earth to be destroyed. This world's not my home. Amen. They're just... And that, please, I, I'm not saying that I'm some eloquent or I've never won any of them either for that matter. But they come and they have the picture and it shows a panda with a child and all these nicey pictures and so on. And it's the United Nations on the front and everybody's getting along. That's, that's not heaven for me. Heaven is where the Lord is. And yes, we're united. And yes, there's peace. But these images, I just can't see this blessing the brethren that are back then that are longing for the Lord, longing for deliverance. So that's why some of those passages, some brethren take them literally. And it will ask you, well, how, do you, how else do you explain it? Well, why are a lion and a lamb lying down, a wolf and a lamb feeding together? Well, it's a picture of peace. If I read that in the Psalms, I'm not going to take it at face value. I read it in the Psalms, I understand. It's a poetic form. He's, he's speaking in metaphor. Maybe in, in heaven there'll be some glorified wolf. And a, I, I'm, I'm fine with that, but I don't think that's really the full thrust of the passage either. Allow the scriptures to have a beauty in its expression too. Otherwise you can come out with some very strange things from scripture too, by the way. And, and people do. There is a danger in systematizing. Amen. This doesn't mean that we want to be chaotic in our thinking. The word of the Lord came to me and you just grab something out of the air. Might be quoting a newspaper for all you know. You want to be disciplined, you want to give your mind over to the Lord, but you want to be careful that you don't come to scripture and put it on the chopping block and say, well, this has just got to be this way. And so, boom, 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 boom. You get it all packaged together. Because that's where some will go astray, is that they, they come up with a system, and the scripture is really creaking under the being forced and put into this mold. And then time passes and current history changes, and suddenly the system fails. Just remember this word from Brother Robert Cobb weird things can happen when you believe false doctrines. <laughs> I love that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment, but I do want to give an opportunity to pause here and let any of your other brethren share. What do you think? Brother Jason? What I have seen in the... There's, there is a difference between what is held dear in the seminary classroom and what is held dear in the church pew. Yeah. And for, the, for, for what I've been exposed to anyway, I don't want to make some broad speaking generalization. Yeah. What I have uh, read and seen, the, the dominant view that is held in the pew uh, 
does differ dramatically from what is in the classroom. And uh, you'll, you'll see that in the classroom, in the seminary classroom today, for the most part, uh, it is pre-millennial view that is dominant right now. Right. But that hasn't always been the case. And right. if you said you already touched on it, but if you right. study history, many times the social uh, climate of the day will actually determine the view that is held most dear. And if you study the history of when you were talking about the post-millennial viewpoint, if you study the history of those times, that was in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there were some very, very strange, we might call them strange things happening sociologically at that point in history that actually influenced the theology of a lot of major uh, thinkers of the day, including Alexander Campbell. And there was progress, progress, progress was the, was the uh, word of the day, so to speak, at the end of the 19th century. And as post-millennial was the dominant view. And so culture does have an impact upon a person's uh, eschatology. Right now, things look bad. <laughs> Basically, especially in our culture. And uh, so premillennialism, which is a pessimistic view, has become more dominant. I think there's a cultural uh, explanation. I, I, I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. Brother Gillen? Yes, I wanted to hear there's one other view that in gaining prominence is called Frederick's view. Yeah. It's 87 years that Jesus is already yep. come and the dead is already raised and he's done away. I'm going to give, this is, this is voice theology. I want, to, I want to affirm that these three views are responsible for the distortion of Christ's coming. I want to affirm that the reason why people back off from it is these three views. These are the culprits right here. Because none of them are clear in Scripture. You can't open your Bible and say, God is one of these. Yet, the picture has been presented that you've got to lock into one of these. You've got to be official. So people back off from it. Because they say, well, you know, I can't see this and just back off from it. Now, there's one thing that all these and the predators do have in common. Christ's coming is not central in any of them. It's not the key thing in any of them. These people don't preach Christ's coming. They preach events that precede or come after Christ's coming. Same with here. Same with here. So here is the here and now. The here and now is the emphasis. Here the here and the now is the emphasis. Here the here and the now is the emphasis. So Christ's coming is not central in these things. You can believe these and really have no personal in, vital interest in the coming of Christ. You just kind of side with somebody. So this is this is Satan's tactic. I can see this. But he did, he divided. He divided the way people view scripture and, and he neutralized it. Neutralized it. Now there's a godly people, my persuasion, all of these. Right. And all of these have an element, there's an element of truth in all of these that, he, that is incontestable. Right. People can walk with So that's, anyway, that's my, uh, my thought. Okay, I saw Brother Seth. These are the way men work out a plan, a system of dogmas, and this very flawed, any of them. Yeah. We're not going to talk about how to do it, do it, do it, but anyway. Yes. But one reason, one way they distinguish the thoughts of one another, the way they take words. They come with the saints and say that's the believers, that's the converts. When uh, elsewhere, it's plain to say, come with all the holy angels. Right. Uh, word saints holy ones. Word holy. The same word as holy when it's with angels. Right. And so don't think that he comes one time for his saints, one time with his saints, and so forth. Yeah. When uh, the, nearly every time it's clear that who he's coming with is the holy angels. Brother, Brother Al? Well, Brother Gibbon said what I was going to say, but I see. Post millennial and non millennial view, I suppose, uh, have most merit to them because they handled the coming of the Lord. I mean, to be that strict. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But they still, but still, see, all the time expressions of the revelation are symbolic in nature. Post millennial is about all time and times and the time. You know, all every single time expression of revelation is obviously symbolic in nature. So they come we come to thousand years in chapter twenty and all of a sudden this is literal. So this doesn't make sense. And the, in chapter twenty of Revelation is one of the most 
obscure portions of the Bible. <laughs> and yet we start with this as our turf for uh, building, you know, building superstructures of doctrine. This does not make sense. We start with something plain to, you know, to build you know, to build scripture. Okay. Good, the main the main reason for the freedom of the is that in the Old Testament God promised the land of Israel uh, to them perpetually forever. Well, the Hebrew word will long mean for a long time, as long as you are, it doesn't necessarily mean forever. And they think the Old Testament prophecy to say they must be literal. And you just demonstrated that they're not. Nobody can enter the Bible tradition literally. And yet they will start with it. But the false statement, yeah. all prophecy must be interpreted literally. Yeah. And if you don't take the one that they want to accuse you of some crime of Brother Bill. I, I just want to share something real quick unless anybody here and is here and their ears may be getting weary already because this subject matter sometimes tends to hit you hard and go over your head. Uh, I want to tell you that I come from a traditional Christian church background, so in that manner I'm largely ignorant of the scriptures. And I come to this gathering that's true, bear witness to my brotherhood in the Midwest in Missouri. And I come to this gathering, and, and I am bored by many people with their ability to, to just have Scripture ready to tip of their tongue. And I am very much impressed and encouraged by that, and I hope to someday be a lot more efficient in Scripture than what I am. But there is a whole society of people who we are with every day who speak these terms as you speak the Scripture. Yes. Yeah. They do. They are not able to equate the scripture with these terms. This is their doctrine. This is their life. This is everything. And I want to encourage you, even though some of these words are, are wearisome and collegiate, learn them so that you can take the scripture. And when they speak of these things, you'll know what to say to them because they need it. Yes. yes. What I've wondered since I've come into into Christ um, now, eleven years, I wonder what it would be for someone to not know any of what's gone before, to have a total zero knowledge of history and to just have the word. Yeah. Maybe I should do that with my children yeah. and soak them in the word. Yeah. And then from that viewpoint, you view Augustine City of God. From that viewpoint, you view Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth. You, instead of See, I come from a background that was, I was soaked in the premillennial. That was, that was Sunday school stuff. Which, when I came to Christ, I've got to tell you, I, I thought it was comic book stuff. Because you look at the scriptures, and it seems so evident to me. Instead of being promoted out of fear, I, I know for a fact, if you want to get, in some circles, a full altar, when you have an altar call, you preach on premillennial stuff. You identify Saddam Hussein. I've been in the meetings myself. People get terrified. What does that tell you about faith? What's that tell you? They're holding on here. They're not ready to go. Amen. You know, brethren, there, we want to have a, such a readiness that, that even if we're mistaken on the details, we're still on the Lord's side. We haven't gone chasing after what, those that Jesus warned us about. Lo, here is Christ. There is Christ. There's a Christ in all these views, too, and so you have to watch who you're coming with. Amen. Now, Brother Aaron. I'm kind of in a position with Brother Bill. I've grown up in a Christian church, and this right here, right now, is my first exposure to this. I've preached the gospel for four years now, and this is my first exposure to this. And honestly, in, in my knowledge of the scriptures and my walk with Christ, 
was what's predominant in my mind when you were talking about this is where's faith? Yep. Yep. Yeah. That that was my honest consideration yep. in all this. Yep. Let me uh, let me share something with you that I was privy to. Brother Brother Seth. There's quite a distinct difference between the millennial thousand years and the other. The millennial thousand years is a reign of power and authority and might here upon the earth, and they are saying if Jesus is king, you have to have a throne, he's a son of David, the throne of David has to be in Jerusalem and uh, well, where you mentioned that it failed at the end, during that thousand years, the people are the people, the Jews are the people of God, and the return to the old covenant, even to the sacri other sacrifices and sacrifices yep. of Jesus. And this guy's where it really denies the gospel. In the other two, it's the gospel uh, that has applied to the people of God, and faith is the way of being the people of God. In the first one, it doesn't claim that. That's why the free is dispensational. Mark dispensationalism is that the Jews are the people of God that speak from Christianity. That is not true. The New Testament denies it. That's true. I cannot accept that too. I don't have any clear concept of the other two. They kind of fuse, confuse, fuse together to me and so forth. But I cannot accept premillennialism because it denies the spiritual nature of the church, the power of the gospel, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the victory of Christ. Amen. Also, there's a switch in plan. Yeah, yes, all yeah. right. Yeah. Having, having to give up the, uh, the original plan and make the church subject, then give up the church, go back to the fourth plan, and it, it gets more detrimental the more you get into it. However, it may sound good at first, like it's victorious, but it is a kind of defeat and a denial of the power of the God. Now, bear in mind, we have generalized greatly trying to put these in categories. There's a whole host of varieties in all these, which, which by the way, should tip you off in some yes. way. That, that when Jesus is talking to fishermen and says, I'm going to come back for you. So that, that should tip you off. Sister Betty? Come up closer. He, he said, what he said was that there's some of these plans have such a special emphasis on the Jewish identity that they lose the significance of church. And if you read through the epistles, it's where the two have become one. That the, the only way the Jews will come is through the Messiah. But there's some views where there's a little bit of moving on that. So you have to watch that. Jason?
see, but the problem is that Nick, in the, in the church world, in the theological circles, this all lies in the realm of crystallized reality. I mean, these are, I mean, like amillennialism, see, there, they have, uh, there's some men in amillennialism that spiritualize everything. Everything. Everything, everything, everything you can imagine. That we would take, there are some things in the Bible that we could be taken to. That's for sure. But they, but these, they go overboard and they spiritualize. See, that's wrong. Yeah. So you can't, you have to, you have to, and there's nothing wrong with, like, on, on this kind of a subject. Now, are we going to back off from Revelation 20, having said all this? Are we going to no. say, well, we don't want, this is a taboo chapter, we don't want to talk about it. No. See, that our approach is to be, there's nothing wrong with your theology being in a place. Yeah. On areas like this. On areas like and this. And so, let God teach you. So right. Just have these words down in your, in your soul. And, and just think about the words of the scripture. Just think about other things that God has said, and let God teach you. You have to have the words in your mind for the spirit to have the material to work on it. Now I want to take just a moment and share this. This is going to be a tip-off. Now, again, I don't want this to be a whole, another hour on free meal. That's going to be dry. That horse is going to be dead. So I'm, I'm going to guide on this. I'll take input in just a moment. I was sitting in class with a, and I'll just say it this way because it makes me sound good, a major New Testament scholar. Very prominent. We're studying on this subject. One of the brothers in class who's a, it's a fine brother that I've been in, able to walk with some at seminary. He says, I wanted to know why you have a premillennial view. Now he's explained the whole thing. He says, just what was the main cause? What, what really brought you to this view? Because the, the brother in the class has like a reformed background, so he actually had to change from an omelet mill camp to, to pre-mill. Now, what do you suppose the answer was? What would be some honorable answers? Somebody says, well, that's just the way I think that Revelation 20 should be interpreted. I think that's what it's saying, and, and that's, that's why. Now, I can work with that. He cares about the text. That I can work with. Somebody says in, in a different camp, they say, well, Old Testament prophecy. I really think that uh, some of those land issues that were mentioned, that you need a, a, a millennium to get those fulfilled. Which, by the way, most, uh, most of us here would probably point to the new heavens and the new earth as fulfilling some of those things. Or other things being fulfilled in the church even before that. Or in the spreading of the gospel. There's some variety there. Or what if he said, well, you know, I came under the influence of such and such teacher. And he really, I, I saw that, yeah, he was right. Or if they said it was a seminary. Or if he said it was Schofield's reference Bible. But now listen. Why did this sharp PhD, why is he premillennial? Because the premillennial interpretation of Revelation 20 accords well with an earlier apocryphal book, Esdras. I almost fell out of my chair. This guy affirms the reliability of Scripture. If you know uh, Trinity, they'll fight you tooth and nail on issues of inspiration and inerrancy. Tooth and nail. This is the word of God. It's reliable. But when it comes down to why does he adopt the view of that portion of the holy word, he, I couldn't believe he said it. Like if I was thinking that, I just wouldn't have even said it. But he actually goes back to point to, now apocryphal, that means not Bible. That's not technically what it means, but it's not in the Bible. It's not the sacred word of God. It's some phantom book that was cobbled about with some rabbis around the time of the Lord and so on, or sometimes before. But he goes back to Esdras and says, well, that apocalyptic, apocryphal book, it, it seems to accord well with Revelation 20. And I thought, my word, he just betrayed something. Now, just suffice to know, uh, the day of dispensational premillennialism, and if you're not following, just come back in a minute or two, is fading historic premillennialism is still has its strength historic premillennialism is not near as offensive they just say we think you know the millennium coming and they don't get into all the 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 knit knack uh got to rebuild the temple got to redo animal sacrifices that is just so it's, it's that's profane to me there is another creation and it's this progressive dispensational premillennialism and you will find 
some companionship there with them, that they will be affirming many of the same things you would. But I'm just saying, there's all these different formations that are going on. But I think I heard some young man say on uh, Tuesday morning something about when he shall appear, that's all going to change. You can have these formulations, but when Jesus comes back, there's going to be the end of all the debate on it. So you, you want to guard your heart that you don't become caught up in all this. Amen. One other brief word, and then I open it. Brother Jason tapped on, on the issue here that when you look at what causes a dominant view of Scripture, there are historical forces at work. I, I, that's, it's so clear that actually it's asserted when men write about it, and, and I've actually wondered about doing research on it to see if you could actually demonstrate it, but I haven't really come up with a way where I could. But everybody recognizes that when you look in the 1800s, across denominational lines now, not just in one camp or another, but a, for, all the way from people who are paid a Baptist to immersionist, all the whole spectrum, post-millennialism was dominant. There's this spirit of progress Jason talked about. Things looked good. Yeah, you had the Civil War, but wow, we got train and telegraph and you have this progress. You have a World War I and suddenly trench warfare changes people's theology. And what you had people who were post-mill, they see this, they see the depression, they see World War II, and suddenly that hopeful expectation that the gospel will fill the earth and will convert the earth and usher in the reign of Christ, many of those people will leave that post-mill and become more amillennial in their view. And right alongside that is this growth of premillennialism, which says, oh, see, this is the mark of this and this is this and so on. So, so, so just be aware of that. I'm not saying that and this is what I really want to do avoid. I don't want you to think you come to scriptures and it's already programmed how you're going to come out of it because of who you are. See, that's what you have to guard against. The word is pure. The word is true. Thy word is truth. The Holy Spirit's working in us. And it is possible to have nothing between. To, to have a sensitivity to the Lord where you're not bringing in all this other baggage and so on. Be, be at guard on that. But just as you step back and look at it, you can see this, which should teach us to be kind of careful in, in, in that we assert, this is the view. Because if we stepped out of history a little bit, we might see a little variety. Brother Bill. Yeah, so the, uh, the baggage or the preconceived ideas that we bring into these things influences so much how we see our side of the outcome of this matter. Yes. And I, I've gone through the tapes on interpretation by uh, Dallas and Lovitz and Howard Hendricks. Sure. There's no way I can understand using his interpretive outline that he could ever come to a pre millennial position. It does seem like an exception, Just doesn't it? Shit. I mean, ever, but to a degree, I know very few people that, that don't do that in some area of the Bible. Salvation is another issue. Of should, it should make us cautious. This is the same thing. It's right. It should make us really look at ourselves. Yep. How do we rise? Yeah. Let's say how. Yes. Brother Seth. I'd like to make another caution. Uh, two or three of these, I'm going to say they're very many preachers, but I've known them. Very energetic and other effective. The doctors view, they say, it doesn't be caused. It's the life. You can't do it. Right. Like a immediate coming victory, yeah. and you can win convert to it, and uh, right to have people succeed in my business. Yeah. And I don't like that one, but it's no. no. Really good. Yes, uh, some, some years ago we were having meetings in a uh, home from the Empress of Jesus, and they were just coming to the Lord, and one night we gathered together and they came visiting in the great, great planet Earth and just been written and she brought this book in with her. And it, it was all about coming to Christ. And a lot of the turners kind of went to the people over there and they were going to ask them. So I said, well, I don't know if you're going to get upset and they've got to lose the people to do And before she had a chance to go over this book, uh, I said to her that it's good that it's an old aphorism, but it's good to know that only it's good to know and we come to learn things unknown. If you want to read the Bible where it's really clearly talking about Christ coming, no question about it, what was he emphasizing? Now he is coming, you better be ready. 
And before I finish, he stopped and said, I believe that all my life. She says, I know. I know that's what the Bible teaches about Christ coming. See, if you stick with what God has said, the power of the scripture is in its affirmation, not its explanation. Don't call it explain it if you know what it means. If you, have, if you stick with it, pretty soon you begin to think about Christ coming in the in this context of surrounding of God's word, and you you will come up with the right conclusion. You know, he won't leave you there really in that way. One spirit, and and rather than coming up with a position, yeah. you will come up with an anticipation of the coming of the Lord. Yeah. Now there's a theory that was alluded to earlier that I want to address. It's the millennial day theory. The idea is that God took six days to create the world, rested on the seventh. By estimates, you hold to a, a uh, conservative view of the Bible chronology, you end up with 6,000 years of world history. Adam and Eve being in the garden about 6,000 years ago. There's some flexibility, but pretty solidly. Okay. So as the year 2000 approaches, you're going to have more talk about it. There's going to be some variety. Some will be that the beginning of the seventh day will, uh, will be the Lord's return, and it's the eternal state. It's a, that's it. There's others that will say, well, that seventh day will be an actual thousand years glory on the earth. Now, if you hear a view like that and, and you, you're skeptical, what you'll say is, people always come up with views that serve their purpose. Now follow me on this. Notice how that's going to fit in with our, within our lifetime. So maybe I could do something with that kind of doctrine. Get people gathered around me. Go out to the mountains with this. Get them persuaded in this way. Do you know how old that doctrine is? It's in a little book written in the middle of the second century, early second century, the Epistle of Barnabas. That's very early. That church in the few generations after Christ, there was already one teacher that was saying this idea. Now, bear in mind, Barnabas didn't benefit from that theory. Do you see that? Jonathan Edwards, when you read some of his, there's, and some of those in his day might look toward that year 2000 and wonder if that's when the Lord will come. They would not benefit from that. So when I hear something like that, I want to be sensitive enough to say, our Lord is very precise. We might have some understanding while we're in the midst of it of, of how he's doing. There's promises that way as well. You see the blossoms on the bushes. You know when summer's coming. So you, that expectation is there. But our hindsight will be flawless. Now, let, let, think about this for a minute. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, when did that happen? Why, at Pentecost at the actual physical Pentecost. That's how precise God was. Amen. He didn't work out this outpouring of the Holy Spirit just on any old day and then call it Pentecost. It was on the actual Pentecost. Amen. You read through Scripture and you'll see how precise God is. Now, I'll give you a matechism. My opinion is that when the Lord comes, there will be sections of Scripture that we really didn't think about in connection to this and suddenly we'll see that's what God's been doing. Amen. And I'm going to illustrate it. Amen. If you lived in the generation before Christ Jesus and you were a God-fearing, faithful Jew, would you expect your Messiah to be a lot like Melchizedek? You have one little passage in Genesis. One verse in the Psalms. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's it. Are you going to major on that? Are you going to gather a group around you called the Melchizedek? I'm not going to try and get some coin, some term there. Melchizedekians. Are you going to, no, you're, you're going to major on things that the scripture has majored on. But you know what? When Jesus comes, he did come in the order of Melchizedek. And was it just a little thing? My word, Paul in Hebrews, he just unpacked. There's a whole chapter and more about the connection of Melchizedek and how it's not like Aaron, it's not of Levi, not... Wow! I gloried when I first saw that Hebrews. Wow, that was in there. I had read enough of Scripture that I knew that 
the episode from Genesis, didn't know about the prophecy that's cited there in Psalms and then showed the fulfillment in Hebrews. My, my understanding is that when we get where the Lord returns, I bet there's things in here Amen. that suddenly we'll see it. Amen. Now, some of your study Bibles will have uh, pages that show you about the different fe feasts, the different uh, gatherings of Israel each year. Now, there's a physical Passover. Was there a spiritual Passover? Our, the Lord, our Passover? Yeah, there's a spiritual component to that. There's a, there's a New Testament reality to that, certainly. It's at the core. There's a physical Pentecost. There's a, there's a spiritual Pentecost when the Spirit comes. So when others will go further with it, though I disagree with their interpretation, I do down here. I have to be fairly generous and say, the Lord has done this before. He has worked with an actual time and a physical event. He has. He worked with an actual Passover. He worked with an actual Pentecost. But I'm going to illustrate some of the weakness. Turn to Jeremiah 32, please. Jeremiah 32. 37 through 41. Now you know Jeremiah is writing in a time of captivity. They're not come home yet. Jeremiah 32, 37 through 41. Here's the promise. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath, and in great indignation, and I will bring them back to this people and make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good, for the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that will not turn away from them, to do them good. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. And I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I brought all this great disaster on this people, so I am going to bring on them all the good that I am promising them. And fields shall be bought in this land of which you say it is a desolation. Without man or beast, it is given to the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money, sign and seal deeds, and call in witnesses in the land of Benjamin. And, and so on. I will restore their fortunes. Now, if I was Jeremiah and I received this word from the Lord, you know what I'm going to think? I'm going to think, we're coming out of this captivity. We're going to go back to the land and we're going to be able to have our property back that we've been driven from and our children will inherit the land. I'm going to think that. And so sure enough, when you get the return, uh, early 500s before Christ, that's what happened. But I'm not going to, frankly... I don't read this passage and, and assume that this means, as it says in my study Bible, regathering of Israel in preparation for final day of atonement. That's not necessarily what that text says. So I, when I first, I'll tell you, when I first went to Trinity, I, I was, I was kind of nervous. Here's all these big gun premillennials. And I thought, maybe I don't really know, know my stuff. And, you know, they've, they've been in the Old Testament and... Gleason Archer knows about nine languages other than English. And then I hear their arguments and I say, that's it? This is the, this is the great beast I was afraid of? They're, some of these brethren will go into the Old Testament and they'll take things and say, oh, well, this is clearly talking about a millennial temple. Well, you know what? That was written before Ezra. Maybe it's talking about an actual temple. Let's just be honest enough to say maybe this is just talking about the temple now again i know that prophecy has a nature that it speaks of sometimes a physical fulfillment close at hand and a longer range fulfillment i know that there's there's a term that's called an already and a not yet component in prophecy it's very helpful i'm going to illustrate this for you turn to uh, isaiah 61 please isaiah 61 where, where do you remember this passage from in your, in your scriptures? Luke 4. Luke 4. What's happening? Jesus is in his, in, in his hometown synagogue reading. I'm going to read Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that 
in Luke 4 is where Jesus stopped. Your text continues in Isaiah 61, and the day of vengeance of our God. If I read Isaiah 61, I would see these events like this. The Spirit of the Lord upon me, good news, gospel, and the day of vengeance. You'd see it together. We know from the, from the Lord they're actually apart. There's an element where, from Isaiah, he's looking. Let's see, how am I? Boys, stand up for me, two of you. Stand up, stand up. Benjamin, come and stand right here, right there. Right there. Now, if I'm Isaiah, and this prophecy comes and I'm looking ahead, I don't see two boys, I see one. And I think they're going to be right by each other. But when you come in the history and you come to this moment, and here's Jesus at the synagogue, the day of the vengeance is still down the road a ways. Thank you. Can you see it now? You've been included. Now that happens a lot. I'm not going to take time to demonstrate over and over, but it does. It happens a lot. Here's one other example of it in the New Covenant. The New Covenant Scriptures. Revelation 12. Remember what's happened in Revelation 12? Woman in pains to be delivered, dragon wanting to destroy the child. In one verse, you go from Christmas to Easter. One verse. You go from the entrance of Christ into the world to his ascension. She brought forth a man-child, verse 5, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. You even pass Easter on to the ascension. Once. One verse. Scripture can be like that. It's not deceptive. It's, that's just the way that it's communicated. For, for the purpose of, of God writing in, Reve, in Revelation chapter 12, he can put those two events together. Those are the two main things, isn't it? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. A little further down in John 1, verse 14, Word was made flesh. That's what matters. All the stuff in between is important. Crucifixion is important. Resurrection is important. He goes back to God, to the right hand of the Father on high. That's, those are the big things. That's why it emphasizes those. So when you get in some of those prophecies, somebody wants to get you digging around and just focus on that prophecy, you want to have a spirit that says, well, how did the apostles handle this? Because they handled it differently. And I, I'm, I'm going to illustrate that. Anyone have any comments? Brother Seth. You guys who are interpreting the Old Testament in the way the New Testament is interpreted. If it doesn't, it's left for us to wait to see the Old Testament. Yes. There is um, a spirit of... I keep wanting to use the word caution, and I'm not sure that that's actually capturing it. Go ahead, Brother Tim. There's an element where you you want to you want to be able to stand for truth and defend truth, whatever the environment you're in, whether it's academics or the workplace, wherever. You've got to have a stand for truth. So I, I don't want to abandon that area to the others, but I don't want them to be setting my pace and them to be sounding out the cadence. Just a brief word on history. You want to have somebody that changes the way things are done. They do so because of what God has given them. The fact that Luther was involved in the Reformation was not because he was Dr. Luther. It's because Luther believed the Psalms and wrestled with the Psalms and wrestled with Romans. And God worked in him. Not because he was Dr. Luther. Amen. But because he was Dr. Luther, people heard what he said. Amen. They didn't say, ah, oh, that monk. They had to deal with Luther. Now see, that's, that's the balance in that as you look at it. You, the Dr. insights John, from God. Hmm? Dr. John the Baptist. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Amen. Uh, Brother Bill. Brother Bill. Brother Dave, you told me to try to fill a kid show and not men people. Kids who talk about David are very pensive to people who do not 
Yes. You still have to sift them. They may be putting things together that aren't. Let me give an illustration here from Acts and Amos. Acts chapter 15. Here we deal with the issue of what do we do with these Gentiles. Don't forget Acts. It's a Jewish church. It's, it's, not, it's not Brother Bill. It's not Brother Gibbon. It's not Brother Jason. Later in the book, you get Jason's working in there. But in the early days, it's a Brother Simon. Acts 15, what are we going to do with these Gentiles? What happens? James stands up in the meeting. James says, To this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. And then he, he quotes this prophecy out of Amos about David's tabernacle being rebuilt. I'll build the ruins thereof. I'll set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth these things. Now, you go back into Amos 9 and tell me if in the middle of Amos, as a Jew, when Amos' prophecy came out, you were going to read that and say, oh, Gentiles are going to be included with the Messiah. You won't. So the, one of the dangers is somebody will take an Amos text and they'll say, oh, this is going to mean that the temple is going to be rebuilt in the millennial reign. When James is saying right here what the prophet is saying, the Gentiles come in under David's tent. So... Be, be aware of that. How, how have the apostles used these things? And, and why, why don't the men who, uh, God, through whom God wrote these new covenant scriptures, why don't they sound like the men we hear today? Why aren't they giving us all these great details? And so many, I've got a, a book in, in, in my office, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. I don't recommend it. I'm amazed at how much he, he gets pictures out of little bitty verses that aren't talking about it. Talks about a millennial temple. Talks about reinstitution of, of sacrifice. Some of the views, you, you, as you get into them, you say, wait a minute. Who's going to rebel after the millennium to bring in this final battle? Well, that's going to be the children of the saints that are... And you just keep going. Well, when are they raised from the dead? Well, that's not covered in the text. They finally get to a point where they say, we don't know this. Let's have a healthy view of sometimes be able to say, I don't know this. The Lord might be working with me yet, but I don't know. Yeah. Brother Gibbon. You notice too that the more you talk about it, the smaller Jesus becomes. Yeah. He keeps pressing, he shrinks back, and the main thing is a position. We call ourselves out of the position. We call ourselves out of the position. We judge ourselves out of the position. See, in the scripture, there's a spirit in the Bible. There's a spirit. There's a God speaks the scripture, not to formulate the systematic theology. That's what the Lord dreaded.
for the word of God, for the word was made flesh, he if God couldn't speak as plainly to them as he does to us. Amen. But this is but here Peter, but Peter's taking the same text from Malachi chapter three, and this is how he says it. Chapter two, verse five, he says, Be also as blindly stone, are built up in the spiritual house, and holy priesthood, to offer us spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In my judgment, that's what Malachi is talking about. Brother Jason. Yeah, this issue of uh, Roseth already laid a good principle that we interpret the old on the basis of how the New Testament is written. And just, just another insight perhaps about interpretation, what kind of thing we're talking about right now. When an apostle, or for that matter, the text you read in Acts 15, which that record is an inspired record. What that man said was an inspired saying that is recorded in Holy Scripture. The apostles took Old Testament passages and used them. Many times they were taken out of their literary context. Many times they were what we would not do. The reason for that if an inspired, this is one, this is kind of my philosophy. If an inspired apostle can take a text out of context, because he's inspired, he can take a text out of context and do what they did with the Old Testament scriptures. I'm not saying that they were proof text. No. They, they were not. They had the spirit of the text now that within them. When you have the whole, they were inspired. When they wrote the New Testament, the same Holy Spirit that wrote the Old Testament was inspiring them to write the New Testament, and they didn't have the spirit of the text. But no man, I don't care who he is, has the right to do that kind of proof texting in order to prove, to prove a preconceived theology. What, what, the only thing I would say a little different is it seems that the apostles, guided by the Holy Spirit, are aware of a broader text. A broader arena, a broader context. That's right. It's there's a literary context, and yes, that's the safe rule. You don't take things out of that. But when you get to Hosea 11:1, 1, out of Egypt, I have called my son. And here in Matthew, he shows this is this is the journey into Egypt by Christ. This is pointing to that. You, that should make you sensitive about how we come with our interpretation. We want to be very careful that we don't lift it up. Beyond the apostles. In this issue, one of the examples that you were giving of these men who take these Old Testament passages and they say, oh, this is obvious. Obviously, it's a, the new temple during the millennial reign. Obviously. Yeah. And, and see, they might say that the apostles did that too, but they don't have the right yeah, that the apostles, apostles had to do that. That's what I'm saying. We cannot authoritatively follow that teaching like we can follow the teachings of the inspired. In the New The prophet Daniel, after he received his uh, remarkable, remarkable revelation, he said, Lord, he said, Oh, Lord, said, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and God said, You're not going to either. Told us to go to the book of the That means somebody after Daniel has to understand what Daniel said, and Daniel didn't know what he said. He said, I don't understand what I said. But he told the Lord that he didn't mean to bring the He didn't know what he meant. So that tells you what you opened up this a little bit before. That there comes a point in time when God begins to work where things become plain and work plain before. And I gather that it's going to be the same with Christ's coming. To me, it's absurd to think that there were signs of Christ's first coming, because he told him you can't see the signs of the time. He didn't know the day of your visitation. Well, there weren't elaborate prophecies about what was going to be in the day of the visitation. There were a couple, but there weren't all of those. But they didn't recognize him. And when the time begins to unfold, God's going to do something, he won't do nothing until he reveals it to his service of prophets. And suddenly, it begins to think of being complained in the scripture that it's not Christ's plan. Where, where we fall into problems as, as men is when 
It's not been made plain to us, but we'll go to the text and we'll cobble some things together here. And so you have the date setters of the previous century. He's going to come in 1838. Oh, he's going to come in 1843. Their spirit's still 